Hi, welcome to another BAPT in conversation webinar. Um, great today to have someone who I've wanted to interview for a long time. Um, someone whose book I read um, in the, near the beginning when I was starting to learn about type. Um, something that everyone should have on their bookshelf. Uh, it's one of the classic uh, books in, in modern typology. Um, so we're going to introduce today our guest is Angelo Spoto, who's a licensed mental health counsellor from um, Tampa Bay in Florida. Um, got a master's degree in analytical psychology, co-founder of the C.G. Young Library at Tampa Bay. Um, worked for, for many years as a counselor um, with Jungian uh, work and, and typology as well. One of the people putting typology back in context with Jung's work. So welcome, Angelo, how are you doing? I'm doing very fine. It's great to be here with you, Richard. Yeah, it's great. So and, uh, I'm just interested in that, in that history. We had a little chat before this, but um, you know, I'm interested in, in your sort of career path briefly, how, how you got to where you are now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a, a circuitous route, especially after graduate school. Uh, I didn't have any a gameful and employment, so to speak. Uh, I, I came from a history of ideas background and uh, that was not gonna pay the bill. So I ended up signing up with the city of Tampa recreation department. And that was my summer job while I was in school. I was uh, a coach, uh, kids uh, mostly inner city parks. And when I got out of graduate school, I was a coach uh, with kids, inner city parks, sort of chop wood, carry water. Huh? And uh, I continued to uh, be on the playground for a few years uh, and got, you know, some promotions, ended up downtown. Uh, during this period, I actually had discovered Young. It wasn't in school. Uh, Young was sort of persona non grata. And uh, while I was uh, in this career uh, of being a coach, uh, I got hold of my first volume of Young's and I couldn't stop. So for the 10 years that I worked for the city, I was kind of a closet Jungian. I was reading Young uh, at night and I was coaching by day. And then eventually I became a, a district supervisor for the city. That was a little different experience um, doing payroll, hiring and firing and you know, the things that supervisors do, I was able to convince my director uh, that there was this group in Gainesville that had uh, a training uh, uh, program on the Myers-Briggs. And uh, how about it? Will you send me up there? Will you get me trained? I'll bring it back and we can use it for team building and conflict management and communication styles and uh, so I was very fortunate to have Mary McCauley and, and uh, Gordon Lawrence and Scott Ankers uh, give me that wonderful training program out of CAPT. And I came back to the city and, and I kind of became known for that in the city. Now, by the 10th year, uh, I was uh, starting to uh, wreck city cars. I had a city car and uh, in a walkie talkie and I was vested in all the stuff that a, a supervisor, a good supervisor would sort of get by putting that kind of time in. And in the 10th year, uh, I wrecked uh, three city cars. And while this was going on, I had a series of dreams where Young and I were walking around the lake uh, in Zurich, Lake Zurich, which you can't walk around. But in dreams, you can get away with all kinds of stuff you, you can't get away with in daylight. And he and I had wonderful conversations as I uh, was simultaneously, you know, wrecking city cars. And um, after I wrecked my third one, I knew I would wreck a fourth one and I'd be dead. So within a couple of weeks, I turned in my resignation and uh, I went back to school. I went back to graduate school and, and met the requirements for the master's uh, in analytical psychology, worked closely with a couple of analysts as part of that program. And uh, then a couple more years to get licensed in the state as a mental health counselor. 
And for the last 30 plus years, that's what I've been doing. I've been, a, I would say, a Jungian psychotherapist. Uh, and I've had a private practice uh, now for, you know, 30 plus years. Mm. It's, a, it's a fantastic story that this turning point in your career, dreams, um, the messages from the unconscious. Um, you know, what was it like for you realizing that something had to change? Well, uh, you know, I tell people who come into my practice, if there's an opportunity, you know, uh, I'll save you a couple of car accidents. Uh, now, that may sound a little bit of an inflation, but only half so, because if you don't listen to the unconscious, you don't have a practice of listening with the unconscious to the unconscious. You know, it, it sort of is going to get you one way or the other. So uh, I was very, very aware of the reality of the psyche at that point when I wrecked my third city car. And uh, I ran a stop sign, hit a bus on the wheel. And uh, these people were going, they were older folks, they were going to St. Pete to watch a play. And um, I totaled my city car and, and I did not scratch the bus. Mm -hmm. and, and it became so clear as my director came out and told me, you can't wreck any more city cars, that I would wreck another city car. And it won't, it won't be like this. It'll be the end. So, you know, another thing I sort of say, it's a bit uh, self-effacing, I guess, but, you know, therapists are the worst of the lot. I mean, we're so thick, you know, you, you figure I would have got it after the first wreck or the second wreck. I mean, it took me three wrecks. Mm. And, uh, you know, we, we were reluctant to leave our, our comfort zone, too. So the unconscious sometimes will work to make you uncomfortable. You know, in the process of squirming and the pain of change, you know, we, we, we think of all that as negative, but, you know, that's sometimes how the psyche operates to get you to, to, to go in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. and, and so is that a, part, a major part of your work, you know, helping people find a, a, an instinctual direction through dream work, through other activities? Yeah, I tell people, you know, if you're going to come in and work, pay attention to dreams, affect states. By that, I mean emotion. Usually my prompt is where's the heat? Where's the emotion? Synchronicities and somatic states. Those are the, the four things that if you're going to work with me, you know, we want to we want to pay attention to those, at least those. I don't tell them pay attention to car accidents. That kind of becomes obvious. Mm -hmm. I want to get it, you know, at the point where it's brewing. Not, not necessarily at the point where it's a disaster. Mm. At what points do you to, to use typology in, in this work as well? Well, the role of the ego, uh, in spite of what some people believe uh, about Jungian psychology, is actually critical. And, and I do look at typology as helping us to discern an ego pattern. And, and when Jung wrote uh, his book, Volume Six of the Collected Works, he was definitely pursuing the psychology of consciousness. The center of consciousness is the ego. So, you know, I want to bring that in to any sort of therapeutic uh, uh, venture, you know, that the person becomes self aware of how that ego pattern could be working in their everyday life. And, you know, another thing is, um, we sometimes think that, you know, the ego's in the way. It certainly can be, but, but you do need to have a, a strong ego, which doesn't necessarily mean, you know, to dominate other people. It means a strong sense of I in order to go into the unconscious. So it, it does become important as the unconscious presents more and more, you know, that we have some sense of what's going on at the ego level. And uh, a lot of that journal article that we'll probably get to a little bit, you know, is based on this tension of opposites between ego consciousness and the unconscious, or what I call in the journal article, you know, the superiors and the inferiors, the superior functions mm -hmm. and the inferior functions set up this tension and hopefully, if one can hold that tension, you're going to get uh, the transcendent function, the quintessential function, the fifth function, 
starts to come in in behalf of the archetypal self, symbols start to arise and consciousness is served from the perspective of the whole. Mm. So that context we were talking about, the, the, con the conscious and, and unconscious, you know, how critical do you see that to typology from, your, from Jung's original model and, and what's happened to it along the way? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, the Myers-Briggs is really, I, I consider it a movement. And uh, Catherine Myers, who uh, I worked with over a couple of decades, uh, you know, was very concerned that uh, in the enthusiasm that the Myers-Briggs seemed to inspire, that, that the branch would break off from the tree. And she wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. A matter of fact, we did uh, annual retreats on Jungian topics with her core group, uh, many of her people uh, who, who I think she regarded as, you know, important to the to Myers-Briggs. Uh, and we did it on Jungian topics to make, make the connection between typology and Jung's larger model. That's what was behind my book as well. That's where she kind of uh, uh, got hold of me was by way of the book. When you met, when you went to do type training in, in Gainesville and you, you met Mary McCauley and Catherine Myers and so on, like, what did that bring to you personally in your own work on yourself? Well, I was in a position uh, that uh, I really understood better, typologically speaking, you know, as an ESTJ, ISTJ, it was good shorthand for me to explain why I was not comfortable in doing what I was doing. Now I did it well. I mean, I got good evaluations, but I also, by the 10th year, I was wrecking city parks. Mm -hmm. So my preferences, you know, in Myers-Briggs language were uh, INFP. Now in the journal article, what I'm suggesting, this is the evolution of my thought, is that in the first half of life, we develop two functions in both attitudes. Mm -hmm. And and the Myers Briggs addressed some of the lacunae in Jung's original work, namely uh, it was able to sort of figure out the attitude of what is called the auxiliary, but it leaves out so much. And now this whole type approach is well, let's look at the typological matrix, so to speak, that Jung came up with, and what we see is uh, eight psychological types. And everybody sort of understands those types as uh, the attitude and the function that comes together. Mm. And you know, when we talk about psychological types or cognitive modes, it, it really is important to see the 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 togetherness of the attitude and the function because mm. it's really the two and the one. It's two things that come together to be one thing. Mm. Yeah, and since they're never separate. Like they manifest as one of the eight. The eight. That's yeah, correct. And I guess I'm with you on that. That you know the the eight are the fundamentals in a sense. Right. And we talk about it as if there's a basic function and an attitude coming together. But in a sense, they're as I see them abstractions more than components. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you know it really is a revision, and and the Myers Briggs has had a, an incredible influence. So it's almost as if you're having to sort of take another look at Jung's original work. And if you could look at it from the perspective of what, what I refer to in the journal article, you can look at typology from the perspective of the archetypal self. And that's that diagram I sent to you, the mandala, the squaring the circles, the squaring of the circle, which shows the, the four functions and the two attitudes. You know, it's, it's a symbol of the archetypal self, but from the perspective of typology. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a, um, a, an innovative way to kind of approach Jungian typology, because we're looking at it from the perspective of the archetypal self, of wholeness. We're looking at typology from the perspective of wholeness. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in you know, the different ways that the eight functions are written down so your notation is like e and extroverted intuition some people yeah. write 
and E. Um, you know, what's behind your choice in doing it this way around? Well, I kind of gave you a little preview because um, I think visually uh, there really is no point, in my opinion, of diminishing either term. And we speak in terms of extroverted intuition. And, and uh, I know that it's accepted now, uh, you know, that we say N-E and you, you, you use the E in subscript. Uh, it never set well with me. And uh, John was gracious enough to, you know, kind of let me throw my tantrum and get away with this. Um, but I would also ask, as we said earlier, when you look at extroverted intuition, you aren't, you aren't suggesting that one is smaller than the other, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at two in one. So I, I wanted it visually to be more sort of like that, that image of, you know, the two in the one thing. Yeah. Now, it's, it's going against the grain, and I, I can probably hear people, you know, making an exception to this. And, and I've certainly had when I've done workshops on this model that's in the journal, you know, we, we do have interesting back and forth on this topic. But I think anytime you're working with an established position, the Myers-Briggs, the, the, the way that the, 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 the nomenclature, so to speak, is set, that, you know, to push back on it is probably to create a certain amount of heresy or controversy. And, uh, you know, we just have to kind of go into it as it, as it happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's an interesting point, you know, to, to not diminish either one, you know. You know, psychological types started out with extroversion and introversion. And Jung conflated extroversion with uh, feeling, and he conflated introversion with thinking. And then he got to sensing and intuiting, and what he was trying to do was, he said, you know, in, in talking about extroversion and introversion, I was trying to explain too much with too little. So he brought in the functions and he was trying to capture the nuance of what he was observing. That's also what was behind these notorious three pages in, in psychological types on the auxiliary function. I think it may have led us in a... a, 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 a I'm not going to say the wrong direction because, you know, there's so much good stuff that has come from thinking along those lines. But what I'm suggesting in the journal article is the real key sort of uh, insight that, that is over and over talked about in psychological types, especially in chapters two and five, is the problem of opposites. Mm -hmm. And the problem of opposites is best described as the superior function and the inferior function sort of facing off with each other. And uh, really the most radical thing I say in this article is that I'm asking people to consider that there are four superior functions and four inferior functions. And that in the first half of life, you're gonna have two functions in both attitudes. And in the second half of life, the other two functions in both attitudes will challenge you into a deeper experience of the psyche in which contact with the archetypal self is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I mentioned that the transcendent function, uh, when you hold the tension of opposites, the transcendent function is actually operating differently in the first half of life and the second half of life. In the first half of life, it's, it's actually helping to generate the ego pattern. Mm. So it, it exists between the unconscious and the ego. In the second half of life, it's actually taking you into an experience of the archetypal self. So it exists between the unconscious and the self. Now, the archetypal self is Jung's uh, image for the archetype of wholeness, order even meaning. So the second half of life agenda, uh, uh, unlike how our culture seems to present the aging process as it, as it is, you know, something to be feared and everything is lost. Well, you could make a case from a Jungian point of view that actually everything is gained 
because so much has been left out in the first half of life. And, and as you go around the midlife turn and you, you, you pick up on this material, you are becoming increasingly whole. It's work. It's not easy. But, but that's the way to go. Not to, not to cut yourself off from so much that really belongs to you. Wow. So, you, I mean, that's really key points there to this model that I put up on the screen as well that you were kind of referring to. It'd be nice to unpack it and explain it even further for people. Sure. And how in, this... in, uh, go ahead. Did, you, did I cut you off? No, well, I was just, I was just going to point out this, this, this midlife turn being this um, curved arrow at the end, I believe. Is that where we're talking? Yeah. Yeah, I used uh, in the journal article as an example uh, of the model, I decided to uh, pick Jung uh, and explore his midlife turn and what was going on with the Red Book. And uh, Jung thought of himself for a long time as uh, introverted thinking. Um, actually, John and I agree on this, that he's introverted intuitive. And uh, I just have listed uh, on both of those diagrams, you know, the differences, how they would sort of play out developmentally. But the net outcome is uh, Jung would develop in the first half of life intuition and thinking in both attitudes. So when he makes the midlife turn, what's he going to run into? He's going to run into sensing and feeling on the introverted side, according to this developmental line. Well, the Red Book, you can make a very good case that what Jung is exploring in the Red Book by way of these images and, and uh, so much of what he's dealing with is his feeling function and eros mm -hmm. from the introverted perspective, introverted sensing, introverted feeling that you can actually get, and I'm not trying to reduce the Red Book, you know, to typology, but you can get an interesting perspective on the Red Book, you know, what he's up to. Now, I go into more detail in the journal article, but um, I, I do find it affirming that, you know, you can approach the Red Book and, and there's a kind of correlation with his typological work and his midlife term. Mm. Just to clarify for the audience, the, um, the article is in the Journal of Analytical Psychology, uh, Centenary Edition. I believe it was released in December 2021, um, edited by John Beebe and uh, with a range of guests, authors, um, including Angelo Spoto. So that's if you want to look that up, it's the um, Journal of Analytical Psychology, Centenary Typology Edition. Yeah, uh, and including Richard. I was in it with a with a film review as well. It's true. Um, made it in, but um, let's explore this model a bit further. And um, I mean, this being also my own typology as well. That I, yes. I'm a type. Um, so, so breaking it down, we've got vertical arrows between, let's say, the, the dominant function, introverted intuition, and and the extroverted sensation. Um, tell us more about that axis. Well, as ego consciousness, as the ego pattern develops, you're going to have uh, an emergence and eventually a differentiation of psychological types. The hero archetype tends to be behind the emergence and the differentiation. So, you know, there's a certain kind of heroic quality to coming into the world at the ego level. You know, you're saying, I look look at me, look at, look at what I am going to do. And then typology gets more into the specifics. What does that I look like? Well, once a, a superior function is differentiated, you have the opposite in the unconscious. The vertical is illustrating the tension between superior and inferior. A, as you probably figured out, I, I don't really want to go down the road of the auxiliary. To me, those four at the top are all superior functions that contribute to the ego pattern. And I call them superior because 
they are capable of helping the ego out. So I don't need to designate an auxiliary function, you know, just because these, these cognitive modes, these psychological types are contributing to the ego pattern. Mm -hmm. Now, once you hold the tension of opposites, the transcendent function kicks in. And in the first half of life, it is contributing to the ego pattern. So it creates in this model and Jung's uh, typology, it creates introverted thinking. Mm. Then there's a tension of opposites between introverted thinking and extroverted feeling. The transcendent function kicks in, it creates extroverted thinking. Tension of opposites between extroverted thinking, and introverted feeling, it creates extroverted intuition. Now you have set up the two agendas, typologically speaking, what happens in the first half of life and what's going to happen in the second half of life. It looks regressive. And, and in Jungian psychology, it's often experienced when you do work with the unconscious, like you're losing ground. But then again, Jungian psychology is very pa paradoxical. So uh, from the ego's perspective, it looks like you're losing ground. From the perspective of the archetypal self, you're gaining. You're adding in. Now, because these are inferior functions, I do ascribe to von Franz's take on the inferior function and uh, Jung's take on the inferior function. You know, it's, it's opening the door to all kinds of unconscious material. So these inferior functions can be incredibly challenging. And one can get stuck anywhere along the way. So I caution people about looking at the developmental line as, a, as too linearly. Everything is happening at once. In, in some sense, you are experiencing wholeness all the time, but you may not be able to tell it. You know, your awareness, your consciousness, especially in the first half of life when you're carving things up. You know, the alchemists were... Uh, famous for their, their notion of solve et coagula. You know, you take things apart and then you put them together. Well, in the first half of life, you're differentiating. And then in the second half of life, if you're aware of what's going on, you're actually putting things back together. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but often the pain of going down, just like when Jung was in his descent, you know, his Red Book period, the pain feels crazy making, feels like this is not, I'm not gaining anything, I'm, I'm losing it. Mm. So we're talking about these curved, sort of like curved around diagonal arrows as transcendent function. Um, and it's creating this, this next. Uh, it's creating the third thing, the tertian yeah. non-dator. So if you have a tension of opposites, you know, there's something missing. And the, and the transcendent function creates the tertian non dotter, the third thing that isn't present. And, and in the first half of life, that can be accounted for typologically. In the second half of life, the transcendent function actually is operating more traditionally as we understand it, uh, connecting one to the archetypal self. Mm. So, I mean, that's how I've always thought about the transcendent function. Um, you know, if you've got these opposites of introverted intuition, extrovert sensing, it kind of it integrates them. And what you end up with is, is a kind of composite function that's neither one nor the other, like more than a, more than the sum of its part. It's kind of a perceptive function that, that doesn't kind of get stuck in either one. And right. Yeah. So is that what you mean for the, 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 the second part of life, the bottom line? Yeah, the, the second, the bottom line is going to take you uh, and again, be careful about thinking too linearly. Mm. You know, it's almost like implicate and explicate mm. order or what uh, mm. Fernand de Saussure talks about as synchrony and diachrony. And he doesn't mean synchronicity. He means like in the moment and then historically. So we're trying to look at both things at once. When you make the turn and you go into the quote underworld and you encounter the opposites, typologically speaking, um, those opposites functioning as inferiors will expose you to the archetypes. And if you, if you can stick with it, you're going to experience the archetypal self, which is kind of 
you know, it's it's a superordinate archetype. Now, you know, there are many, uh, for example, James Hillman doesn't buy that at all. He, he does not want to really bother with this notion of the archetypal self. He's more, say, a polytheist. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't want to look at the God image within. He wants to look at many images of God within. So uh, I think I'm a little more uh, maybe faithful to Jung in this. I think that the archetypal self is critical in Jungian work. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I would impose it on anybody, but I definitely want to be open to it because uh, as, as some of you may know, if you visited Jung's house or even seen the pictures, vocatus non vocatus atque deus adorit, called or not called, God will be there. You know, you walk down the, the sidewalk to Young's house, the double doors, you see chisel on the threshold, you know, this Latin phrase. Well, he's basically saying the archetypal self is there, whether you call it or not. It's, it's really, you know, going into that uh, Jungian theory, uh, what I'm interested in is like, you know, the people you've worked with in a, in a really grounded way, like the phenomenology, the everyday experience, yeah. Like for people in this second stage here, after, and what, how would you recognize, first of all, the turn? You know, what, what are people actually going to see and recognize? And secondly, then this second part, you know, what's the actual phenomenology of it like? Well, the, the, the way you recognize the turn often is in the collapse of the ego. The ego pattern just doesn't cut it. It doesn't hold up. You feel dissatisfaction, depression, anxiety. It's like whatever worked in the first half ain't going to work in the second half. So there is a drop, there is a, a descent. Now, you know, you also in that descent, you're vulnerable and, and what is most frequently experienced if in that vulnerability, you can be open to it mm. are synchronicities, meaningful coincidences that suggest, I mean, synchronicities are really the language of the archetypal self. Or you could say, mm -hmm. if you wanna use religious language, you could say the grace of God. Synchronicities are ways of telling you, you know, it's not about the ego. The ego gets relativized. You're put in a much bigger story when synchronicities occur. And, and when you go into the second half of life, you know, it's not all bad news. You, you are open to something that is superordinate to your first half of life agenda, something greater than a, a mystery that wants you to, to, to appreciate it, to, to maybe even live into it. Mm. So the, I mean, like I said, these perhaps symptoms of, you know, things falling apart and then yeah. sense of mystery and coming into something greater. That's what we're talking about as an experience. That's it, that's it, that's it. Now, you know, we can talk about it, but, uh, you know, talk is cheap, except when you're talking to the therapist, right? The, the mm -hmm. idea is to experience it. You've got to experience it. And, and there's no way that that can be imposed on a person. You know, you can almost, you know, you, you almost have to ready yourself for it. You have to be prepared that, you know, you're not in charge and be open to, you know, what is coming to you, you know, and not clutching, not grabbing, not, you know, demanding, because all these things which are really, you know, ego driven agenda, you know, will get in the way of that experience. Hmm. It's nice to see that this, this you always get two, two goes at experiencing and working through each of these, these major vertical polarities, you know, what's it, is it, what's the difference, if any, between, you know, experiencing this like this first polarity in the first half of life from when you might experience it again later and have to face it? Well, I think you're, you're actually rehearsing some because uh, when that tension of opposite occurs in the first half of life, you do get some relief. Something is created and keeps you above the line, but something has also been given up. Mm. So, so you're, you know, it's like Rumi says, die before you die. You know, it's kind of like a, a rehearsal. So built into the first half of life agenda, whether you know it or not, it's not just, you know, 
building an ego uh, pattern. It's also experiencing losses along the way. Now, in the second half of life, as you work through the, 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 the missing parts, um, you're going to experience uh, uh, confusion. You're going to experience uh, an initiation into the mystery. You're going to experience um, uh, anxiety, maybe depression. Um, but you're also going to, if you can take a few breaths along the way, you'll, you'll experience intimation of the whole. Because all of those negative experiences are really based on resisting what's down there. Mm. So if you hold the tension of opposites, you're, you're no longer resisting, you're holding it. And something is created. The transcendent function will give you something. Now, once you do the midlife turn, that's the big turn in life. And, and the whole structure feels as if, the ego pattern feels as if it can't, it can't cut it anymore. It, it's not satisfying. So where are you going to source your, your awareness? Where are you going to source your experience? Is it going to be trying to do what Jung says, restoration of the persona, you know, to get the ego back, to live the second half of life agenda like you did the first half of life? Or is it going to be in being open to the whole, the experience of wholeness? From, from a Jungian perspective, and I certainly... You know, I was fortunate to work with a couple of analysts and, and uh, they absolutely were helpful in this. From a Jungian perspective, healing and wholeness are almost like synonyms. I mean, the healing comes from being whole. You know, it doesn't come from being, you know, ego driven. The ego has a purpose, mm. but it's not going to deliver the goods ultimately. It'll just make you more and more neurotic. I mean, to the degree that you want to live the second half of life with the first half of life agenda and not go through that experience, you probably are going to make matters worse and worse or make, it, make matters worse and worse for other people. You'll take it out on other people. You'll project the inferiors. The, the, the experience with the inferiors will be in a sense wasted because you'll find all of that material, typologically speaking, you'll find it in the outer world and, and, and it will be your enemy. Mm. The people who are, for example, sensing and feeling uh, introverted, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna find some way to fight with them. In a sense, this model, it gives more meaning to those um, four groups of, basic functions of like the NTs, the NFs, the STs, the SFs. Yeah. You're in this model, you know, having one each, you know, the function in both attitudes, it means that your, your, your kind of ego is more built around those, one of those four. Yeah, that's true. And I would invite you, I mean, when, when I was in graduate school, I went to a very sort of science oriented school, not that I was, I, I was in the history of ideas department, but uh, I went to Johns Hopkins and, and their notion of theory was, does it carry explanatory and descriptive power? Mm -hmm. So what I would say is take what we're talking about and look into your own life. And, and see what those two functions in both attitudes, how that gives you descriptive and explanatory power. Does it enhance your self-understanding, your self-awareness? And then if you're in midlife or if you've turned the corner, try and get a sense of what's happening in your midlife. I mean, typologically speaking, my bet is that the, the functions in both attitudes that were kind of left out are going to be coming to challenge you. I used to say in my book when I was, you know, very much uh, addressing uh, Myers Briggs uh, uh, approach, I would say three is closer to four than two. And I was talking about the tertiary and the inferior. Because to me, my, my tertiary is sensing, but it sure as hell acts like an inferior. And it's always acted like, like an inferior. I mean, for me to try to make it into a quote tertiary 
And, and frankly, uh, I'm very strong with intuition and feeling in both attitudes. And for me to try to say, well, one's an auxiliary. No, they, they actually are, they're in my ego pattern and they function to help me move through the day. They have. And then, you know, I start wrecking city cars and I make a, a descent into the underworld and I'm struck with other material. Mm. So, yeah, what we're, we're talking about development then in this model, we're talking about, especially in the first half, ego, i.e. consciousness, conscious development of the functions, in a sense, the ability to use them intentionally. Is that kind of where we're headed with this? So Yeah, we are, because the ego is the source of the will. It gives you a sense of agency. It gives you continuity in time and place. So the ego pattern typologically uh, approach, you know, ha has a lot to do with that. And, you know, when Jung uh, uh, says, you know, the big revelation at midlife is you're not captain of your ship. Well, what he means is that, you know, the will, the sense of intention has been compromised. And, and you know, what forces at play have now, uh, uh, for some, they're going to feel like there's mutiny. You know, like the ego is no longer able to, to keep the boat afloat. So uh, yeah, the first half of life, we sort of want the ego to experience agency, continuity in time and place. It's the source of the will. It centers consciousness, but it, it also is separating from the whole. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea of reconnecting, uh, especially after working so hard to separate, you know, becomes problematic. Mm. So is, is there also a stage in, in the second half of, of intentionally gaining more easy use or effective use of these bottom four inferiors as well? Well, you'll never, you know, I agree with von Franz, you'll, you'll, the inferiors are too big for the line. You know, you'll never bring them into the boat, but you'll have an, an experience that is colored by typological sort of uh, information that is really meant to take you through the doorway into the depths. Um, I, I don't know that intention is really the, the best word. I, I would probably uh, reserve that for first half of life. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, the concept of Wu Wei or receptivity or yin. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I remember this is an old book, but I remember um, I remember an analyst wrote a book, uh, uh, "Psychotherapy Grounded in the Feminine Principle." Mm. Well, I, nowadays maybe that would be a controversial uh, title, but I get where she's coming from. Mm. You know, the in, in her mind, the feminine principle uh, is going to yield, or it, it's yin energy, it's receptive, it's open. Where in the first half of life. There is a sense of, you know, intention, will. I'm going to, you know, make it happen. Mm. Yeah, the reset, the weird way. I mean, you know, that concept of getting out of the way, letting nature do its thing. That's right. Allowing them to arise. Um, That's right. That's exactly right. And Jung constantly is taking us back to nature. You know, that's uh, if you ever think that Jung is too abstract with his notions of archetypes and you know, like, what the hell is this archetypal self? Uh, go back to nature. Because uh, that's just the, the, the flip side of the notion of spirit or archetype, you know, is instinct and nature. And they're two sides of the same coin. And, and, and I mean, Bollingen was about getting back to that place, nature. Mm. So, you know, bring it back to like a, you know, a an introverted and let's not say INTJ because that assumes a kind of an auxiliary in a sense in the typical model. So let's say an introverted intuitive type with thinking arising as we develop. You know, there's this, this special axis here. There's this big polarity of these two, conscious and unconscious. And you know, I know what this is like, the extroverted sensation. You know, someone said to you, you know, go and look for the needle in the haystack and you know, there's only so much attention you can really <laughs> bear to give to this, 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 these strands of hay before it gets too much. And um, 
you know, what's it going to be like, you know, at the end of this, the person who's been through this and not been blocked and, and uh, you know, tripped up along the way, you know, what, what's their life going to be like? <laughs> well, uh, is there anybody that hasn't been tripped up? I mean, uh, you know, if, if uh, you find one, you know, introduce me. I mean, I think our, our failures, our mistakes being, quote, tripped up, uh, mm -hmm. being caught by the unconscious, from the perspective of the ego, it's a disaster. From the perspective of the self, it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you experience by way of the inferiors, the greater mystery, the greater depth of the psyche. You experience your own wholeness. And it is a journey, right? It's not a done deal. Like, it's not like, well, I've experienced it. And, you know, now, you know, I'm enlightened and, and I've got everything, you know, figured out. No, one of the nice things I think about Jung's work is he very much acknowledges, you know, tension, mistakes, failures, suffering. Uh, mm. it, he just figures that if you didn't have that, you would be kind of a cartoon. You know, mm. you, you just wouldn't have three dimensions. You wouldn't be human. So, you know, this, this, uh, this journey to wholeness is also uh, about fully being human. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's a good point that, yeah, we all have to suffer these stumbling blocks and pains of, of growth along the way. And I guess that what I'm getting at is there's, there's going to be, for some people, bigger stumbling blo blocks or stuck points that then I yeah. get to come to see someone like yourself. Um, you know, it's something that might need some some professional help to, to get past. And, um, yeah, I'm just curious, like, how, how do you see... You know, just picking any of these axes. How do you see the resolution of that in terms of dreams and symbols as you work through it? Well, you gotta, I mean, it's it's particular to the individual, but in the first half of life, I, I'm wanting to see that the ego pattern is there. Uh, you know, because you you're right, you can get stuck anywhere. You can get stuck at the very beginning, you know, and you don't hold the tension of opposites, you just collapse into the inferior and you know you you can have a a bad time of it but the transcendent function if you can hold the tension is going to bring you back up with something new and the ego pattern will develop now in the second half of life it is a different story you know the the uh the the greater mystery is asserting itself i mean young went so far and caught hell for this i mean uh you know, he, he went so far to say God has a dark side. So in the second half of life, you know, it's not going to be, you know, a, an easy walk uh, through the, the tulips. I mean, you're going to be experiencing a lot of what probably at the ego level, you know, you could do without. And yet the drive toward wholeness is, is pushing you to see it through mm. Mm. sometimes i think the ones that suffer the most you know take artists for example who who and i don't want to get you know i don't want to romanticize this notion but um the suffering artist you know the artists who the artists tend to be a little closer to the unconscious from the get-go and and they may suffer more uh and and it's not always you know a great yield it's not always a, a pretty picture but they they do give us so much and and in some ways um you know there's neurotic suffering and then there's suffering right there's neurotic suffering you're doing the same old same old and you can't get out of your own way and then there's the suffering that takes you deeper and and you you find things out you know and uh, kurt vonnegut used to talk about artists as the canar canaries in the in the mine shaft you know, you send the canary down into the mine to, to see if there's any leaking gas, right? And if the canary comes back out, then it's safe for humans to go in. But if the canary doesn't come back out, you want to stay out of that mine. And artists tend to, you know, they, they go into those places and, and how much can they endure and how much can they bring back? They bring it back in their art, you know? And then we are, we are looking at, something that maybe you know we couldn't have got to but by way of their art by way of their suffering you know we are now in contact with it 
Mm. That's fantastic. I think we're getting near the end now. I'm just, I just saw, you know, there was a question, you know, there from, um, how do you use this approach in your mental health counselling practice? I think, you know, we've kind of, we've, I think we've hopefully answered some of that along the way, you know, in then looking for the ego pattern, looking to see, you know, if there's a strength of, of the ego there, you know, able to, to handle this kind of turn and, and to seeing where someone's at. I mean, it's a good question is like, how, how do you kind of assess using this model where someone might be? You know, if you're not using a typical Myers-Briggs kind of four pairs of preference sort of um, instrument or something, then what are you using or what kind of approach? Well, they'll, they'll pretty much tell you, you know, what the ego pattern is. I mean, after you get to, you know, talking about certain situations and, and their history and, you know, what is, you know, currently sort of in play, you, you do get a sense. It's, it's, it's not all that difficult to know, you know, which are the two functions operating in both attitudes. It, it is a little difficult sometimes to see where they are in the process. And then you got to be radically uh, individualistic in the sense of, you know, look at that person, you know, what's going on in that individual's dreams. Uh, what is the archetypal self wanting them to know? How does the archetypal self want to get their attention? You know, we're, we're in a very funny place right now, uh, culturally. I, I remember when I was working on my master's, I kind of came up with my own little manifesto of, of uh, you know, things I wanted to keep in my practice. And one was a line from Blake, the most sublime thing you can do is set another before you. And we're in a funny time now because we tend to explain people away. You know, we tend to sort of like figure them out or fix them or label them or, and, and uh, just, just the fact of, of having someone in front of you you know, is a sublime act. That's a good place to start. Uh, you know, one of the things with COVID, you know, I've done more of the, the Zoom and, you know, I get to see you and what have you, but um, I've, had, I've had some trouble. I mean, I, I'll, I'll do uh, clients, you know, we'll, we'll have our sessions over Zoom, but um, this is a little bit of an intruder, this computer. You know, it, it, I don't know what exactly... How is it affecting that relationship? Mm. Uh, what's the other line from Blake? Uh, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in, an hour, uh, in a flower, to hold divinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. I think it's something like that. You know, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower. I mean, all right, what the hell is going on with him? What do we have instead of that? See, it's going to be nonsense before long. What we have is a cell phone. We have one of these. Now, how is that getting, getting in the way of our, our, our contact with one another? That great mystery, you know, between the I and the thou. And, and it, is, it is individual. I, I, I know I'm not giving you the answer that you want to hear, but with each individual, it is different. Mm. Yeah, no, I get the sense of that. I mean, we're going to have to stop in a minute. I think this is another question's come in, you know, about making sense of, of the dreams and interpreting. But I guess, I mean, the way I've, you correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the way I'm seeing is that if you can establish what the typology is, what that kind of ego um, arrangement is here, then you might then get a sense of where they're stuck. Like what pair of opposites are they currently struggling with? You know, what's, how can you recognize, you know, the, the issues of, let's say, um, introverted thinking, extroverted feeling? You know, are they issues of like relationship and, um, you know, issues with- Well, it, it, it goes into, you know, your, the knowledge that you have of these cognitive modes or psychological types. And, mm. and again, I don't want to force that stuff on the dream. I wouldn't want to reduce a dream to a typological explanation. But I do mm. think in the dream work, you can see this tension of opposites mm. between, say, introverted thinking, extroverted feeling. You know, you, you have to kind of know what introverted thinking is about and extroverted feeling is about. And then you have to give the dream, you know, a way to, to present itself, right? Mm. Not to impose, you know, Jung used to say theories in psychology are the very devil. He was very aware of taking typology 
you know, and, and smashing it on the person's psyche. So, so it's useful as a tool. And, and part of what I was trying to do was, you know, open it up and, you know, let it breathe. And then as you get dreams, you know, you can use it perhaps with more versatility, uh, more creativity, you know, to explore the uniqueness of the person and the depths of the psyche. Mm. And so I guess, like you're saying, it's a very individual thing how one person's unconscious will represent, symbolize the qualities of these functions in subtle ways that, that will come out. And you might recognize, you know, they may be projecting it onto with to people that are themselves typologically orientated with these functions. You know, right. it becomes like almost examples of role models for those functions in their dream, perhaps. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, this notion of individuation implicitly acknowledges the uniqueness of the past. He, he's not saying individualism, but he is saying that each path has a unique quality to it. it it's one of the, the reasons that I felt, um, okay, I didn't go to an institute, but I did stay on my path. And, and it is important to kind of, you know, get that feeling. Uh, another one of Jung's lines is personality is Tao. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in sync, when you're in, in accord with that, Whole, that deeper truth. I mean, ultimately, I think most Jungian therapists are wanting to, <clears throat> you know, to have that experience with you. Mm. That's wonderful. I, I'm, I'm going to have to draw it to a close, and it's been a really fantastic, fantastic conversation. I thank you so much for sharing. It's really helped to explain this, this model in a, in a way. Hopefully, everyone's grasped it a bit easier now. I do point everyone as well to the paper in the uh, Journal of Analytical Psychology where you've written about it as well. It's wonderful to see how your work's evolving. And I'd love to have another conversation again and, and follow up and you know get even deeper into it as well. well. Thank you, Richard. It was great being with you. And with, yeah. the, with the folks out there, and send me uh, an email what you think of the article. Yeah, all the best. And um, take care and uh, see you again. All right. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming.